I'm I'm real big on building relationships or being in the studio. Majority of people that I've seen getting placements wasn't by email. It was because they knew somebody or they were in the studio with that person. And then mm-hmm. the records kind of came together like that. You are now listening to the Music Business Dreams podcast brought to you by KDMR Music. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Music Business Dreams podcast. This is episode 22. And I'm your host, Brandon from KDMR Music. I'm super excited to have you here. As always, uh, we've got a great show planned for you today. Um, I spoke today for this week's interview with Ray Clemens. He is the founder of uh, the Uberwood Agency, as well as the Famous Factory. So he is focused on growth strategies for independent musicians. And that is great because for today... And for the rest of 2018, that's what we're focused on on the podcast. Different strategies, tactics, action items that you can take right now to grow your music career so that in 2019 and beyond, you can really start to see those changes that you're looking for. So with that said, uh, thank you to everyone who bought a copy of the Music Marketing Guidebook during our cyber weekend sale. Um, It was a huge success. Um, But what I'm really looking forward to are your success stories. So if you bought a copy of the book, you should be getting some emails from me. Please respond. Let me know, you know, how the book has been helpful. If you have any questions, anything like that, I'm excited to help. If you missed out on the sale, it's okay. The Music Marketing Guidebook is still available at our normal retail price of $19.99, and you can buy that at musicmarketingguidebook.com. Now, if you were looking to get a coaching call, uh, and if you did not buy one during the sale, those are still available as well at the regular price. Those are a little bit more limited, but you can uh, schedule your call at kdmr.us slash coachme. Um, but that's enough particulars. Again, I'm excited to get into today's episode, so let's do it right now. So guys, today's guest is Ray Clements. Uh, now Ray started as an artist and from there stepped into songwriting. Um, now after earning some placements for artists overseas, he decided he wanted to expand into the technology side of the music business. So he joined the music app startup Buzznog, and he does artist relations working with different artists in the industry. Um, And he's also founded his own agency called the Uberwood Agency. And through that, he's founded the Famous Factory with his partner, Lynn Banks. Uh, The Famous Factory offers marketing services for independent as well as major artists. Um, So it's been pretty successful so far. And Ray's working toward being becoming a household name in the music industry. Um, But I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, Welcome, Ray Clements. Hey, man, I appreciate uh, being on the show. Oh, no problem, man. Uh, well, thanks so much for reaching out to me. Um, I checked out some of the stuff that you're working on. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. So I'm excited to kind of have you on the show and just really dive a little bit deeper into your background and what you're offering to artists right now. Oh, um, definitely. So um, I know I just read your bio, but I mean, I don't think anyone can tell the story like you'd be able to. Um, so I'd love for you to just give us a little overview of, you know, who you are and kind of how you got started in the industry. Well, um, starting from college is when I actually started in music. Uh, first, I was a big sports guy. Um, I played basketball first and I ended up tearing my ACL. Then I had to figure out basically what I had to do next or what could I do next. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, it just so happened that my roommate, he was a, a artist himself. And then uh, one of my cousins went there to school with me and they were always recording. It was like a group of guys or whatever. And um, they came to me and was like, man, why don't you write a verse? Of course, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, <laughs> but uh, I, I decided I said, man, I just write this first verse or whatever. Of course, it was terrible. But, you know, it, it sparked something in me, like that whole creative nature, the creative juice start flowing and stuff and from there just started recording all the time learning different programs and stuff started recording myself you know learning how to mix and all those type of things well I thought I was learning how to mix the proper way (laughs) so I went to engineering school (laughs) and when I went to engineering school at SAE uh, I started I said 
I could utilize this to build relationships. So I started working with a lot of independent artists, started mixing and recording and mastering their records, uh, which I still do to this day. And from there, um, I started, I saw that songwriting was a big thing as far as publishing. Mm-hmm. I started learning more about the business and it kind of took off from there because my whole background from college was in marketing. So right. I uh, ended up getting two deals with like Warner Brothers and Sony UK. Um, and then I ended up getting a, currently I got a publishing deal with Ultra Music as a songwriter. So from there, I just still wanted to mesh all of that together with the agency and stuff because the business side of things, the music tech really intrigued me. So from there, man, I um, decided to, you know, see how much I could help these other artists come up with all the stuff that I went through in the industry. So in a nutshell, okay. that's pretty much how everything came together. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, just because when I, when I talk to someone who has, has had dealings with the major industry, so to speak, um, I try to get as much insight from them as I can because, you know, you're in a position or you've been in a position that a lot of asp- a lot of artists aspire to be in. You know, um, a lot of artists think that a publishing deal or a record deal is like the answer to all of their prayers. And that's what they're in the game for. So um, I want to talk about some of those experiences that experiences that you had. Let's talk about I guess first, let's kind of talk about the path that got you to the publishing deal. And we can kind of talk about um, how you feel about publishing deals after that. Um, but how did you go about getting those deals? Because I know you said you were working with artists that were overseas. So how did that how did that start for you? Well, yeah, so basically from me building the relationships, like always helping artists, I guess the good karma came in the form of opportunities of working with like uh, bigger producers. So from there I was always doing demos. And I ended up getting a placement with uh, George M. Garrard. He's actually signed to Ultra Music. He's like one of the biggest DJs over in France and Paris. I ended mm-hmm. up getting a uh, um, placement with him. And that initially sparked the publishing deal. So I got in touch with the CEO at Ultra Music or the person that's over the Ultra Music Publishing. And it all just came from that me always helping others. Essentially, I would tell anybody like that's how I got to where I got and I put myself um I put myself on the back burner for the most part and then just focused on helping everybody else based off of the knowledge that I had gained in the music industry. So Okay. Cool. And I mean I don't I don't want to get too far into your pockets or anything, but can you kinda of talk about maybe some of the terms of that publishing deal? Uh and how favorable it was to you? Oh yeah, it was very favorable. It's it's basically a um an eighty twenty split like the terms um i didn't take an advance up front because i didn't want to go through that whole loan process or owing anybody back money i have the freedom to create as much as possible i work with all the a and r's on the team and i'm really close with the sync team so i took an approach to focus on the the sync license more and then if i do get the placements with the artists that comes like i've gotten two or three more but the terms basically is like a three-year deal um didn't take an advance 80 20 split very favorable. Okay. So you're creating more instrumental type music? Uh, I would say it's more, no, I, I don't produce. So it's actual songs, but it'll be okay. like uh, more focused on the commercials and TV and uh, movies. Okay. So you're making songs for commercial usage, um, like for commercials, but then also for like television, basically like film and TV cues. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool. So let's talk about, I guess, the difference between that and, let's say, a more traditional artist's uh, publishing deal. Do you feel like there are advantages or disadvantages to the way you have your deal structured or the type of music you work on? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say there are disadvantages based off how I was able to negotiate it because I'm able to, I have the freedom to work with whoever I want to work with. Um, create whatever I want to create. The only problems that I see with the publishing deals are they aren't very, uh, they don't give you a lot of details, right? So I can talk to an A&R and then they'll just be like, send me music. But you don't know who the music is going to. 
you don't know what the relationships are in those things because I don't really like a lot of middlemen. When it passes yeah. through too many hands, it can destroy or, you know, the story switches. By the time it reaches the end person, it could be something completely different from what you first handed off. So I'm I'm real big on building relationships or being in the studio. Majority of people that I've seen in placements wasn't by email. It was because they knew somebody or they were in the studio with that person. And then mm-hmm. the records kind of came together like that. Got you. Okay. And I know you said another key to even being presented that opportunity was the fact that you were such a big networker. Can you talk, speak a little bit more to just the value of networking in the music industry? Oh, that's number one. The The music industry is strictly based off of relationships from my point of view and what I've seen. Um, that gets your foot in the door. That allows you to get someone's email or their con- direct contact number if you need to, if you got a campaign in place or you're trying to make bigger moves in the industry. To me, it's nothing but meeting someone and then not selling to them up front. A lot of people make a mistake. A lot of artists make that mistake of always listen to me, press play, press play, press play. When you got to have some type of value to add to the relationship. Like it works both ways and right. nothing is free. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, I, I know I did a video a while back about networking specifically and, because a lot of artists, it's one of two things, right? They're afraid to approach someone at all, or they're afraid, or they'll they'll approach anyone, like they're fearless. But like you said, they're like, oh, listen to my tape, play me, play me, <laughs> you know? And, you know, what I try to tell people is that it's a two-way street, right? Anyone that's in the industry is there because it's their job, right? Like, we, we, we get caught up in the glamour and the glitz of the music business because we see photo shoots and stuff like that. Right. But the people that are there have actual work to do. Right. So if you're talking to a guy at a radio station, it's like, unless having your song playing on the station is going to have more listeners tuned in so they can get more ad revenue. There's really no point for him. Right. Like he doesn't owe you that opportunity just because your music sounds good in your opinion. You know, so we talk about that um, a lot through a lot of our resources about offering value while you're networking. Obviously, you know, if you're networking with someone or if you're reaching out to someone, it's because you think they're in a position to put you in a better place. But and so you might think you have nothing to offer, but there's always something to offer. And there's there's always something that they need that you might be able to give them as well. Right. Yeah, I've I've seen that on so many different occasions, man. Even when even when I approach people today, like you know, if I say I mention my agency first mm-hmm. before I say I'm a songwriter artist, because there's some stigma attached to that these days. Like, okay, you're artist, you just how many more of them I'm I'm gonna meet, mm-hmm. you know? Versus saying, okay, I actually have these services and these offerings and these results and these testimonials that I could offer. Uh, it may be a service to your artist if you're a manager or something or you or you're a writer. I probably know some producers that I could introduce you to, you know, and then I never give out people's phone numbers. That's the number one rule of mine. Like it's always email first mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with whoever you're connecting the dots with and you know, just ease into the situation. Now after I introduce you to somebody, it's on you after that. Right? right. So whatever you have to offer, and that's something I had to learn. Like, yeah, a person can bring someone to me, or I can introduce me to somebody, but I have to do legwork after that and make sure that that person knows the new uh, relationship that I have knows I actually have value and actually have knowledge about what I'm talking about, so we can right. continue to flourish the relationship. Right. Exactly. You know, this whole industry is built off work. That's the nature of the word industry. So, you know, it's I don't know. People have this idea like there's like a magic wand that someone is going to wave and then they're going to make it and be successful. But there's work even for the people who are already successful. There's work to keep that up. So, yeah, definitely. When you meet someone, you should absolutely, you know, take it upon yourself to show some initiative and see things through. You know, don't be so passive because like like we've been talking about, these people have jobs to do 
and their job is not to check up on you to make sure you're doing okay. Right. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, well, let's talk about the um, the startup that you're working with. Um, you know, what, what kind of services are you guys offering? So, yeah, um, the company is called The Famous Factor. My co-founder with my partner, uh, Lynn Banks, she's based in Toronto. I'm based in Miami. And we kind of, we had experience, right, in the music game. And we kind of came together and this idea just came about. And we had access from different relationships that we've had to get these services in place. So we essentially, we offer um, Spotify services, um, title services, basically like streaming, playlisting, um, IG growth services, uh, iTunes music charting, and more. And so we basically are set up to where an independent artists or a major artist can come in and get those same type of services that they probably wouldn't have access to otherwise to move their single or their EP or their album. Okay. So you guys focus a lot more on um, the promotional aspects of an artist's career. Um, and you guys focus on things like playlisting and curation um, and then other growth strategies to help an artist just kind of see their numbers rise and obviously get the things that come along with those. Um, okay. And so this is something that we talk about a lot um, on our channels and on the, on the podcast in general is about the idea of an artist chasing numbers as opposed to chasing fan relationships. How do the services that you guys are offering how do they assist the fan or the artist in that journey to building up a fan base? Well, the combination of being able to get the analytics, knowing where your fans are, mm -hmm. the um, IG growth services, which attract people um, in your brand and your niche, like the music artists, like similar artists to you and their mm -hmm. fans. Uh, all of those things combined along with creating more awareness on the playlisting platforms, um, really aids in a person being able to connect with the fans and actually know who they are. Like a lot of the mistakes that I've seen and with some major artists, not I won't say all of them, but you'll see that on Instagram, they'll probably have 2.3 million followers, right? Mm -hmm. But then they'll turn around, and when they put out an album, it only sells 40,000 to 50,000 the first week. Those numbers don't add up to me. Right. So I'm more so on the tip of, okay, with this company, we're giving you the analytics. we we making sure that we're guiding you and walking you through. We're not, you're not just purchasing the services and then saying, okay, that's it. No, I'm actually talking to all these artists and basically walking them through, like, different things they probably didn't know or probably not paying attention to. So they know who to target, know where to tour, and, and they're able to, like, really grow a fan base that thousand, you know, you hit that thousand number mark, like Ryan Leslie says, I'm like a decent mm -hmm. living. And so it's more education involved on top of all the services that we offer. Got you. So you, you give them the opportunity to put their music in front of more people, but then you help out on the back end and say, look, the, you know, you've got 50,000 fans, but a lot of them are concentrated in South Florida. So you should think about doing shows in South Florida or things like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, so, and let's talk about the playlist service. How does it work? Um, so I send you my song, and then what do you, what do you do with it? So we vet all the songs. Uh, you'll send the song, and based off of the genre, the tempo, the mood, all of those type of things, we have relationships with um, thousands of curators that can get you placements on these indie and official and editorial playlist on Spotify. And so, and they aren't the bot ones. Like, there are a lot of companies and competition out there. Uh, of course, I won't name them, but they are actually are targeting playlists that are actually people that will engage <laughs> with what you have, you know, your single. You know, because sometimes people will say, okay, we'll get you on playlists, but it won't you know, you won't get but three plays and it, it'll have like 80,000 followers. But people mm -hmm. are buying followers on the playlist. So, of course, they're not going to engage with what you have going on and the results don't add up. And so we really took time to focus on that to make sure that the results add up. 
and everything is in place and keep it very transparent with all of our clients. Okay. So, um, so once I give you the song on the back end, you're, you're going, you're then going and reaching out to these curators, um, and things like that to pitch the song about how long would it take for me? If I send you my song on Tuesday, let's say, how long would it take for me to start seeing results or seeing my song get those placements? Uh, we average around five to seven days. Okay. And then do you guys also, well, you said you vet the song, so maybe this doesn't happen, but do you get where someone sends you a song, you send it to the curators and they're like, nah, this ain't it, dog. Don't. don't oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, you got to think, those people with playlists, they got a reputation too to uphold with all the followers and stuff. So you got to keep the quality there for sure. Okay. And now do you guys do like any coaching services or, or anything like that to where like let's say an artist sends you music they think is ready, but you get feedback like, no, nah, it's not ready. Do you then tell them what to do with it after that? Or are you just like, well, look, just come back to us when you've got it ready. Yeah. I mean, on the, if, if it's on the mixing side of things now, I don't, we don't really get deep into like saying, okay, you should change this and this on the song because that's mm -hmm. the artist's art, you know, people sensitive about their art, but we'll right. just, you know, kindly tell them, nah, this is not going to work. Got and, it. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So if people want to know more about that service, where, where, how do they, how do they get in contact with you? Uh, they can visit the famous factory dot co. Okay. Cool, cool. And let's see. So I want to get into a lightning round. But before we get into that, I want to ask you, what do you feel like is the biggest success story that you and the Famous Factory have had so far? Um, well, the, it, it varies, right? So our last two campaigns, uh, two different artists, um, they were releasing their singles. And how we set it up, we got two packages, right? So on the Spotify playlist pitch, and so the first package uh, will allow you to reach up to 100,000 followers and you get a minimum, guaranteed a minimum of five playlist placements. And the second one is you reach 200,000 follower network and then you're guaranteed a minimum of five to seven playlist ads. So we always over-deliver. So the last two, like the first one, they reached like 16 playlists. Um, and they reached over 300,000, you know, so it's been around those two averages where we've seen it like really over deliver because people really took hold to the artist's, uh, music and then get picked up by major playlists like Tomorrowland and, and New Music Friday and we got them on big, big playlists and stuff. So that felt good. And that was just like last week. And so I would say those two have been pretty successful. Okay, cool. That's what's up. Um, all right, so let's jump into this lightning round. Um, I had my list. I don't know where it went, uh, but I believe I remember these. So, um, so who is your favorite artist? Uh, under 3,000. Okay. Who's your biggest inspiration? Um, dang, that's a good question. Um, I would say Incubus okay. and Outcast. Um, the, the variation of the diversity of the music um, kind of inspired me to look past and look deeper into different genres. And then that helped my songwriting later on. What do you wish more artists understood about the music industry? That it takes patience to end the the music business. <laughs> I wish they understood that more as well. Okay. And now what do you wish the music industry understood more about artists? That is art. And it's not about a quick dollar. Hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> It's supposed to be a lightning round, but let's talk a little bit more about that. What kinds of experiences have you faced where you felt like, um, whether it was some sort of music industry gatekeeper or a label, um, was really impeding your art for the sake of a dollar? Um, I personally haven't really gone through that, but um, a lot of artists that I've worked with, 
they'll be shelved forever. And I know it's because the industry is living. They have a certain formula in place. Like, luckily now they're they're using more data, so it's kind of shifting a little bit or AI mm-hmm. for when they're um, seeking out new artists, upcoming acts. But for the most part, I think that when you try to – they always say, hey, man, make this type of music first, and then – once you get on, make the music that you want to make, which to me is kind of crazy because people fall in love with that formula. So basically, mm-hmm. you won't always make that formula, and then everyone else is going to always make that formula. So everything ends up sounding the same. Right. And I, and I think that's what's going on a lot these days. Yeah. You, when you were saying that, somebody that came to mind was um, B.O.B., I remember when I remember when B.O.B. came out or when I first learned about him, he had this mixtape called B.O.B. versus Bobby Ray. And it was supposed to be like this idea that he could make like club bangers and stuff, but he could also make like folk music almost because he was singing. He had a guitar and all that. And, you know, he hit with was it uh, Beautiful Girls with Bruno Mars. And then he had this and, and then he had another one with the girl from Paramore. And then all of a sudden it was like he disappeared because it was like, I did that, you know, to get on, but I don't want to keep doing that. And then like a couple years later, he had like a huge run of like just club banger after club banger. But then he got pigeonholed from those too. And now it's like, I feel like his last album got like no attention because people didn't know what to expect from him. Right, right. Like you, you <laughs> and that's the problem, right? Like, you get into these rooms, you make these big records that are already pre-made for you. Hey, man, this person's on the hook already. This person's on the hook already. Just put your verses on here. Put the whole package together. You're going to get interviews on all the top uh, music platforms. You know, you go to Big Boy Neighborhood and you see Power 106. And you see them on Breakfast Club. Then you see them on Revolt or something. And then they'll turn around and they're, okay, that's your press run. So now... People all of a sudden pose to like the song and pick it up because they're seeing you more versus you just staying true to your art. And that's the power of what social media is. Not to get off too far on the tangent, but I feel like that's where the power lies in social media for people to actually get to know you. Like people not, the, the music is the commercial, the background music now. Like mm-hmm. people are buying the brands. Like they got to like you. Right. Okay. So here's another question I've got. Um, when it's all said and done for you, because I know you're just getting started, you're young, I'm young, but when it's all said and done, what do you want to be remembered for? Like, what kind of mark do you want to have made on the music industry? I wanted to, I want to be, well, of course, I, like icon status, right? Um, mogul status. Um, and, and really known for like, that guy you can walk up to and, and really help these artists. Like I'm setting goals every year on them. Uh, I got a number in mind every year, the amount of artists I want to help because I know what I've been through in the industry and I know what type of opportunities, you know, I haven't gotten even on the artist side of things. And when I see other artists and I see someone that's really talented and they don't understand the business side, like I take out time to, you know, take them through different topics on the business side that they're going to run into. Something as simple as song splits that they mm-hmm. didn't even know that they had to do after a record is completed. You know, it's little things like that I want to be remembered for. Okay, cool. Um, what's an opportunity you feel like you missed out on or and, and why do you feel like you missed out on those opportunities earlier on? I missed out on it because I didn't really want it subconsciously. I, I took responsibility for it. Like when someone says they want to be famous like a Drake or Kendrick Lamar or ASAP Rocky, it's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And I'm already like super private and kind of like a recluse, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So my music was crazy that like people gravitate towards my music, you know, but it's not at the forefront. I don't speak on it all the time. But I do feel in my heart I could be that big. But at the same time, I'm like, it comes with a whole other ball game of responsibilities right. that I don't know if the people all around me or the people surrounding me would be prepared for all the way. So 
I think that the opportunity that opened up the opportunity for the agency and eventually I probably could, you know, step back into that limelight the way that I would like to, that I see it because I'm building these type of relationships to put myself on. But, you know, it, it was on me. Like your thoughts become things, you know, yeah. however you feel, whatever you're afraid of, that's what's going to happen. Okay. And so this will be our last question, but what is the number one piece of advice that you want all artists to come away with from this conversation? That it takes time. Everything that you dream about, every every person you admire, you know, don't necessarily listen to what people say all the time. Watch what they do. If you want to be successful, watch watch what a successful person does and copy that. Um it's definitely about reading and researching a lot too. You don't know what you don't know, so right. you kind of have to put yourself in a position to figure it out over time. But you got to know it's going to take time. You're not going to just wake up and just have the greatest song in the world and and everyone and go straight up to number one. Now there are some unicorns out there that have done that, but they had a team surrounding them and they had certain things in place in the universe. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I would just say take your time and and learn the business okay cool well ray i really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and you know for our audience to get that insight and understanding from you and again those services that you're offering i think are really cool and could help a lot of artists um so uh before we go can you just shout out your website and all your social media again one more time oh definitely man and i appreciate uh being on the show you uh having me on the show man it's been an amazing conversation um and yeah, so the famous factory, the agency is the website is the T H E Famous Factory dot C O. And my IG is at Ray Fonder, R E Y F O N D E R. And hit me up, DM me. I'm always willing to, to talk to some of everybody. So <laughs> yeah, hope. All right, cool. Well, thanks again, man, for being on the show. And that's going to do it for our conversation with Ray Clemens. Um, I'm super appreciative to Ray uh, for taking the time to come share some knowledge and share his story. I think it's so important for us to, you know, hear these success stories, hear about, you know, when an artist was in the trenches, hear about mistakes that they made uh, so that we can avoid some of those pitfalls ourselves. Now, if you are interested in the marketing services that Ray uh, is offering uh, with what it is the Instagram growth tools or the Spotify promotion, then I encourage you to follow the links in the show notes uh, and reach out to him for more information. Um, I'll be doing that and testing some of the services in the weeks to come. And of course, I'll let you guys know how my experience is as well. Um, So that's going to do it for today's episode. Now, if you made it all the way to the end, then you are a diehard fan. And I'd love to continue the conversation with you. So the best thing for you to do right now is to go to kdmr.us slash indie club. That is our private Facebook community for artists, managers, basically anyone who is, you know, has aspirations in the music industry. It's where we come to network, to share resources and ask each other questions. So that's where you can find me and I hope to see you there soon. Peace.